Hi. <laughs> um, so I feel to share two dreams with you um, today. The theme for what I'm going to share today is about the bridegroom. We're kind of sticking with this theme here of the bridegroom. Um, I felt to share two, two dreams um, and actually a beautiful poem that someone saw my other message and shared that their their mother had written. So I hope that's okay. I figure since you posted it online, she's okay with sharing it. Um, but anyways, the first dream, so my theme is the bridegroom, but more specifically this, um, one of the covenants that the bridegroom makes in the old Jewish customs and traditions that you can read about more if you want to in this book which I included um, in the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, <laughs> the notes or whatever. Um, anyways, one of the things he promises to do besides like taking care of the bride, providing for her needs and um, that sort of thing, is that if she is ever taken captive, he will redeem her. That really struck me. I, I When I read that months and months ago, I have not been able to stop thinking about it. Um, probably because I have been taken captive in my life and he has come after me. And so I know it's true. Um, but also because I have loved ones who I feel like have been taken captive as well after making covenants with him, like the bride does with the, the ketubah, the contract that they make. Um, and it increases my gratitude for him knowing that that's one of his covenant promises is to come and redeem you if you've been taken captive. And there's so many ways that we can be taken captive and, and that's going to tie into one of the dreams I'm going to share. So the first dream I want to share, I, it was actually one of my first visionary dreams. Um, this was many years ago, probably close to two decades ago. Um, and in that, in that dream, it was a very simple, very, very, very short dream. In the dream, I was in a home and I look to, next to me and I see that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are in this home with me. They're standing right beside me. I'm standing on the Savior's right hand side. He's standing on the Father's right hand side. And they're dressed in beautiful white um, clothing. If you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, think kind of like temple white clothing. Um, but not suits, like they were in long, almost like a gown, I guess, but I don't know what you call that for a man, make it manly, but they weren't feminine, they were manly, but they had um, white hair and um, anyways, so I look to my left and I see them standing there beside me and I'm standing right in front of a window that looks out of my house and standing outside of my house, looking right back at me in the window. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of fear of at night, like ever, like when you're closing up for the night and you ever think, you know, if somebody was looking at you through the window, it was that kind of shocking. Um, it was dark outside the window and standing out right outside the window, looking right at me was Satan. <laughs> and um, he had this look in his eyes, like this super cocky, confident, like you're mine kind of look, like I'm going to get you, it's just a matter of time. And it, I started getting really fearful, like that, because he wanted in, I could tell he wanted in. And that made me really scared because he had such a confidence about him that I felt like I had to give in. I almost felt like I had to let him in. And then I remembered, like I looked at um, who was already in my home and I realized I don't have to let him in. I have already chosen who, I, who I've let into my house, me, my house. Um, we're told that our bodies are the temple of our spirit, I've already decided who's in here with me. And it's, it's the Lord and, and Heavenly Father. And um, I don't have to let him in. And he, even though he stands like staring you down through that window, sometimes in your lives, and you might feel like um, you have to let him in, you do not, you have choice over who is in your home. Now, 
back to the bridegroom. So one of his promises, so I've made covenants with God. I've invited the Savior into my life, like so many others who, um, who are out there and uh, hopefully listening to this. And um, despite that, that truth that I have covenanted with God and made that um, commitment to him, there have been times in my life where knowingly and unknowingly, I have let the adversary in. Maybe you understand that. Um, maybe you don't, and that's good too. <laughs> um, so you would think after having a dream like that, that I wouldn't struggle um, with making sure that I never let the adversary in. And that's not the case, <laughs> but uh, it makes me, I guess, mortal. So after, so before I had that dream, I had learned about the savior and this concept of, I will redeem you if you're ever taken captive. And that was from sin, meaning the first, really the first coming to Christ that I experienced in the sense of receiving him in more than just um, through baptism as a little, as a little child of eight, I needed him for cleansing of sin. And that was a really important release from captivity that he gave me. And actually, I think I'm, I need to go back just a little bit. So the bride, one of her promises. So in this ketubah or this contract, the um, bridegroom says things he's going to do. And then the bride has kind of her commitment. Like when she, she gets to choose, she does not, even though I think I had a misconception about um, ancient uh, Jewish customs when it came to the contract, I kind of felt like, even though the dad kind of sets it up, like the parents can set it up, the bride has the last say. The bride gets to choose whether or not she will enter that contract or not. So they kind of present the bridegroom to her and go through the contract and what he's going to do for her. And then she gets to choose whether she accepts that contract or not, which I thought was really cool. If you think about things today, we get to hear about Christ. It's presented to us and then we get to choose whether we accept him in or, or reject that, that offer. And frankly, gratefully, many times we get that offer presented to us again. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, so now to my second dream. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Sorry. The bride promises that if she does accept that, that contract, that covenant, she has a space of time, typically about a year, to get herself ready for the actual like consummation of the marriage. Very not how we do things today. But... Um, it's a beautiful concept when you think about the gospel. Um, we are preparing for the second coming. The second coming is likened unto that consummation where the, the, the bride, groom, and the bride come together and are together and not separated. Um, but between that time, you get to accept the contract, come close to Christ in that way, but he, um, he goes to his father's house. This is, this is from this book. He goes to his father's house to prepare, um, prepare for that coming together. So he's, he's there doing things to get prepared for that. The father, he's, he's preparing, the father provides a space off of his home. He builds a space off of his home. Remember the mansions of my father. There are many mansions in the mansions of my father. Um, or in the house of my father, there are many mansions. He literally adds on to his house. The father adds on to the house for the bridegroom to go get his bride and bring her into the home. That is so beautiful. <laughs> and so there's the bridegroom is getting all these things prepared for that, that day when she's going to come and be with him. And he doesn't even know when he's going to go get her. Only the father knows. The father is the one that says, okay, you're ready. And he kind of says, I'm ready. And the father says, okay, and I'll let you know. And, and then when the father says, okay, go, now's the time. He gets to go. He's very excited. Um, and he goes to get his bride, which he's been waiting for. And so he's, that's what he's doing. So the bride, uh, the bride in the meantime, so all those, all the rest of us who are 
following him, our job is to become cleansed. Um, here, I'll just read from this book. Um, this is Beloved Bridegroom by Donna B. Nelson. Um, so her, she's, her job is to cleanse herself. Now, this is not just their, the body, but it's also their garments. And if you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is going to have a lot of temple um, connection for you. You're going to think about the temple naturally. Um, but so her clothing and her garments need to be washed. Her body needs to be cleansed. And, and she goes through the kind of this purification process. And um, so with that, this is, remember, this is very symbolic of what we do when we come to Christ, right? We, she said, it says she is washed in, it's a ritual immersion in living water. Isn't that so cool? And Christ is the living water, right? So we would probably call that baptism. But in the temple, there's further uh, washings and anointings in, in the temple. So it's all this preparatory stuff for, re for being ready for him. And so her job is to, well, actually, sorry, let me read this little part. It says, our bodies and our clothing both need to be washed and kept clean to make us fit covenant companions. Jesus Christ is our hope or our mikvah Israel, and he can sanctify and cleanse us in every needful way. So he's the one that's really cleansing her and sanctifying her. Her job is to immerse herself in him, in his, in his living water. Um, one of the ways you do that is through knowing his words, like scripture study, prayer, all that good stuff. He is not allowed to be with her, with her. So he sends a messenger. He sends the bridegroom's friend. We would call that the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost or the bridegroom's friend is allowed to trans like relay messages. He, he, if he wants to talk to the bride, he sends messages through the Holy Ghost. If she wants to like have that connection with him. So that's how she connects in a sense with her beloved bridegroom as she's waiting and preparing and getting herself clean. And so think very spiritual now. You're, you're cleansing yourself and becoming clean and ready for this most glorious occasion, right? Um, so then this is another interesting thing that she does. It says, a consecrated bride would concern herself with the matters which most interest interested her new husband. She would spend her time, energy, and resources. Doesn't that sound like the temple? Spend her time, energy, and resources in ways that would honor him. And if you think about when we take upon him or our, our, take, take upon ourselves his name, we're covenanting to change, like to kind of let the old person die and let this new creature in Christ be born. And um, that's kind of exciting. So we spend our time now very differently. We, we focus on honoring him with everything we do, whatever that is, whether we're working, uh, raising children, um, anything really, going to school, anything you're doing, you can honor God in anything you're doing. So you, she spends her time doing that, um, which is, they, they share scripture from Jacob chapter 2, verse 19, which is in the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, uh, for those who aren't familiar with that book. It says, and after you have obtained a hope in Christ, you will do good to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to liberate the captives. So that's an interesting thought. Since his co covenant with you is to liberate you if you're ever taken captive, part of your covenant to him is to be a part of his work of liberating the captive. I think that's really cool. And to administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. So that's, that's kind of our baptismal covenant in a nutshell. Um, but anyway, so it's just kind of cool. Like even the way we dress and the way we act will be affected by that covenant with him. And we're going to be seeking to bring honor to him in the way that we talk, in the way that we dress, in the way that we interact with others, in the way that we choose not to hold on to grudges. Um, we choose to forgive as he's commanded. So we're going to immerse ourselves in his words. I love this book. It's on, it's called the life of the savior. It's all scripture based on his life from all the different books and it's kind of compiled in a more flowing way so cool anyways um but we would be about his business so we got to know his business if we're to be about it like doing things that would honor him right okay so this redeeming him, him coming after us so i had a dream this was this last week um i'm still trying to understand fully the full dream and i'm not going to share it all but there's one part in the dream 
where it starts out with me kind of focused on my children and um, and I need to help them understand um, power, like to be grateful for light and power. I was noticing lights left on but not appreciated in, in my home and that they weren't respecting this light and because it had it came with a cost. It comes with a cost. So this was very temporal, but dreams and scriptures and parables, the way that te the Savior teaches, is often through symbols, things that we can connect to as mortals, having this earthly experience. And then he helps us use those earthly tangible things that we can see and touch to help us connect them to things that are more esoterical or however you say that word, things that are harder to put your hands on to see, things you can't see but are still real, so spiritual concepts. So anyways, I'm like noticing that lights are being left on in my house and the, the kids aren't valuing the cost of that light. And I'm like, okay, I feel this need to help them understand and appreciate the cost of the light that's in our home. And, and I was thinking, how can I help them like, should I make them pay for it? <laughs> like, no, I didn't feel like that was right. I felt like I, if I did that, I should provide the money for them to pay for it. I thought that was it, but I don't know. So anyways, I was like, well, how do I help them appreciate the, the power that's in this home? And I felt I had some thought, thoughts since then, but that's not the point. So I go from my children, it starts out as my children, but then I'm, I'm in a church building and I'm like walking kind of through this church building, and I'm feeling this sense of duty or um, responsibility to help the members in this church to appreciate the light, the power and the light that's in that place. And I first noticed two classrooms that are empty, but full of light. Like the light is super bright in these two classrooms in the church, but they're empty. And I'm like, okay, we're where are the people? <laughs> There's no chairs, like it's just empty. And so I'm like, okay. So I, I keep walking and off to my left, if you've ever been in an LDS chapel or church building, um, you will notice a few things. There's classrooms, there's a, some people would call it the sanctuary, but there's the place, the chapel where we take the sacrament, that's where an ordinance happens. And then you have a cultural hall which is used, it's a big space. It often has a basketball court. Um, it's a kind of a multi-purpose room that's used for having fun and activities and sometimes like receptions and lots of different things. So kind of behind that chapel, there's an overflow and then there's a cultural hall. So as I'm walking, the doors are open to the cultural hall and I look in and I see these, a bunch of, kind of worker bees, a bunch of people, mostly women actually, um, setting up for some activity that's gonna happen, some big thing. And there is a leader in there. I can see that there's a, a, a bishop or somebody that's leading that and um, getting them to do that, put that all together for some event that's gonna happen. And so they're in there getting that all ready and I just kind of keep walking. And as I walk, there's another part of that where the door open it's kind of the back area. So there was a lot of light at the front, kind of by the bishop and the people in the front. And then as you got further back, it got, kind of got darker and darker. And I, there's a lot of symbolism in that. But anyways, as I got to, towards the back, it's like these ladies were finishing setting up these last few chairs. And the one lady looks at the other one. You could tell they've been a little overworked. And she was like, oh, finally, I can go home to my family. <laughs> and I was like, that's interesting. Like, huh. So... I just am mostly observing. So I, I noticed that, I observed that. I did have some thoughts about that, but I'm not gonna share yet. So then I keep walking down that hallway and off to my right now, I see another room. And so we have some rooms in the chapel that are, or in, yeah, in our church buildings that are bigger than others because of the sizes of the groups that would meet in those. We have smaller classrooms and then we have some bigger areas and like a bigger area would be where the children would meet. So the primary room. Another big area would be like a release study room where the women meet together or um, anyways. So it was one of these a little bit bigger rooms. It was really kind of dark. Um, there was a little bit of light in there and there were a few people setting up for whatever they were going to be putting on. And I was like, huh, interesting. But they were very secretive and kind of quiet about it. And um, 
it was like they were trying to kind of keep it secret and um, almost under the rate. I don't know. It was it was just kind of kind of dark, actually very dark compared to what I'd just seen. Um, but they were going about very quietly and doing what they were doing to get ready for the people that would come in there. And the, the space was smaller, so not as many people were going to be coming to that event that they were putting on. So then I keep I kind of turn the corner and I'm in the church building and yet it seems like I've just gone outside the church. So um, but it was still part of the church, if that makes sense. So I think it's just it's all different aspects of people who are members of the church. So I look out, I, look, I go out to this area. Now this is a big area, um, much bigger than the, the cultural hall area and this other little secret group. And then, um, so I walk out there and it's more of a festive like party group. And they've got a DJ out there, they've got a stage and there's, um, they're getting prepped, but there's no chairs, which I thought was interesting. It was kind of like just standing um, and there was a, like a DJ guy and there was some two girls out there and, um, and so it's, it has much more of a party feel and a, um, I'm trying to share this delicately because I don't want to be offensive. Um, but the feeling is kind of the rebels, like the group of rebels, um, people who know about Christ but are choosing to either completely like go do their own thing or are still trying to kind of ride the fence. Like, um, I don't know. It was, it was, it was more of that rebellious feeling there. And, um, just because of one of the conversations I heard between two of the girls that kind of confirmed that to me. So I'm not gonna share that, but, um, anyways, it just kind of had that feel and that was the end of the dream. So, kind of interesting. So as I've contemplated this, I've been thinking about it and praying about it for about a week now. And it came back to my mind today while I was at church. And um, I started thinking about the different groups. And I started thinking about this, this concept of the bridegroom's promise to come after, after us if we're ever taken captive. And there's different ways that we can be taken captive. And I'm not naming all the ways. What I was shown in this dream was ways specifically that I've been taken captive and the, the different things that he's kind of freed me from. And so that's what I want to kind of talk about. So um, the first one was this cultural hall. And the feeling that I had there was, uh, I'm not trying to be offensive, I promise, but it's like the Pharisee, the Pharisee way of living the gospel. It was very Pharisaical. It was very the old traditional way that things have been done in, and now I'm thinking from my perspective, so in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there's a lot of kind of traditional things that are done in more of the hub parts of the church, like Utah and kind of close areas around there. Um, we kind of do things really traditionally and we're very, this is how, so I once was this way. I was once a Pharisee. So I understand this world and I feel like the church has come a long way in trying to break that um, Pharisaical way of doing things. Just like when Christ came um, and set up his church on the earth the first time around, there were Pharisees and they had a lot of like rote traditional, they had taken the laws and they had made them more and more complicated. They had put up walls upon walls to protect you from actually breaking the original commandment. Like you're not even gonna get close to it because here's all these little extra rules and laws. And um, I think somewhere I heard there was like over 600 little laws in the law of Moses, like what they had added to it, something like that. Um, probably don't have that exactly accurate, but the point is, is they were living this very, what would have looked like a very spiritual life, but they were dead inside. <laughs> um, the Savior said that you're whited sepulchers, like you look good on the outside and it looks like there's light, but you're dead on the inside. And 
you know, when the woman looked to the other woman and was like, oh, finally, we, you know, I can go spend time with my family. I was thinking, geez, yeah, I understand that. The way I used to live the gospel was not God's way. And I was often overwhelmed, overtaxed, and um, felt like I was um, not giving due energy to my family, like to the things that matter most, because I was so caught up in the the traditions and not the true like living the gospel and as i said i feel like the church has come a long way to breaking us out of that which is awesome it's time it's needed um so that was one of the ways i was taken captive and the way that god broke me out of that like freed me from that was literally to break me <laughs> um of it he just i'm not going to go into the full story there but he just piled on, piled on, piled on until I snapped. I couldn't do one more thing. And I broke and I was like, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> it makes me think of C.S. Lewis's um, famous quote about God doesn't want to do a little part here and a little piece here. He wants the whole thing out. And he wants to start from the ground up and just rebuild you. And that's exactly what happened. He rebuilt me from the ground up. That was a little over a decade ago that he did that. He saved me from that. Um, and then the second group, these weren't necessarily in order of how it happened in my life. So it, it's interesting, but the second group, the more secretive group that represented symbolically to me where I most recently got enslaved by. So the first one, the Pharisaical one, totally naive. I had no idea that I was a Pharisee. Most Pharisees don't know they're a Pharisee and um, they sin in ignorance. They're captive and they don't even know that they're captive and they wonder why the, the gospel isn't joyful and it's because of how they're living it. It's not the way God's asking them to live it and I could give a whole sermon on that. But, um, but the second one was one I was most recently captivated, captive, taken captive by and also naively and also unexpectedly and it took me a while to realize I was taken captive. I didn't know I had been taken captive. And that's a whole nother story. But it was this world of secrecy and um, conspiracy theory. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people are not, not a lot. I shouldn't say it feels like a lot when you're in it because it seems like everybody is in it. But really, it's a small group um, comparative to the bigger group, I would say, um, or maybe it's just because they meet in small groups. I don't know. It's a very um, inclusive, exclusive world where if you don't completely agree and see things exactly how I'm seeing them, you're not in. Like they will cut you out. And um, so it's very, it has to be kind of clicky. Maybe that was the feeling. It's not that it's not a big thing that's broad. It's that the it's a very um, cliquish feeling in the sense of, man, if you don't see everything exactly that same, it's like you're looking constantly for this group that fits exactly what you're thinking and no more, no less. And, and any other perspective that doesn't agree with you is on the outside. They're the unenlightened ones. They're the ones who haven't woken up yet. They're, oh, you feel bad for them. Um, and you want to wake them up, but well, you know, if they don't want to hear it, they don't want to hear, it. you know, I mean, it's, it's just an interesting world. And that was one of my most recent captivity experiences. Um, I don't know if this matters, but it started with the prepper world, the preparation for the second coming, but this hyper, hyper focus on prep, prepping for the second coming, but the super fearful, uh, all consuming, um, feeling it, it, it doesn't leave you feeling hope and joy and rejoicing that the second coming is coming. It, it, I don't know. It just is very di divisive and destructive. And it, it almost destroyed not only me, but my, my marriage and my, my, um, my testimony actually, um, it almost destroyed me spiritually and God saved me from that. I, I, I still think it's a miracle. I, do, I did not know I was off. And I still to this day don't know how he was able to break through 
the deception and help me see it for what it was and get me out of it. So I'm just very grateful for that. Okay, the next group. So, well, okay, I feel like I need to share a few more things about that. So it started in the prepper world and it just got worse from there. I, it's all these hyper focuses, like you can call them gospel hobbies or spiritual hobbies, but it's it's almost like a hyper focus on something in the exclusion of all the bigger, the other things. And, and a lot of times the exclusion of the things that truly matter the most that are so simple to the core of the gospel that they're kind of boring. It's it's like the sensational. That's probably a good word for it. It's, a, it's like a, an addiction to the sensational. And, and that's actually one of the reasons why I was really scared to do this, to do these recordings about my dreams, because I don't want to be a part of that sensationalism. And I, I have this reassurance from the Spirit that um, my message is not going to be sensational. It's actually going to be quite boring for people who are looking for sensational, um, because it's nothing new. In fact, my husband, um, every now and then I share a dream with him. And I remember one time sharing one with him and he was like, and he's just a very like logical um, personality and there's nothing wrong with that. He's a very just, he was just, he was just speaking the truth, how he was seeing it. Um, he wasn't trying to be mean. <laughs> Sometimes because he's so direct, it, it can seem insensitive or mean, but he's really not. He's just being honest. And I prefer that. I like honesty. So um, he listened to me and he was like, so what did you learn in that that was new? <laughs> I was like, and that kind of hurt my feelings at first because I thought he was almost like mocking my dream. Like maybe that wasn't really from God because you didn't learn anything new. And I ha so it caused me a lot of reflection. And I started thinking about, I was like, nothing. None of it is against what we've already been taught. Like meaning all of it is just stuff I've already been taught like all my life. But what I learned from it was this deeper level learning, this like owning it almost like getting a new level on that concept. So it's, I'm not going to share something that's not doctrinal or in the scriptures that you couldn't just read yourself. So if you're looking for that, you this is not the right spot for you. Um, the sensational is out there. You can find it everywhere right now. It's everywhere. Um, and I'm not trying to be offensive to those who are in stuck in that bondage right now in that place and don't even see that they're stuck. I was there too. So I get it. And um, so this is not me saying anything bad about you or um, anything. It's just, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I just don't want to be offensive. But this is not the place for sensationalism, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, this is hopefully to help you take the gospel, what you know about it, and take it in on a deeper level, an, an additional understanding that maybe you hadn't seen before. Um, my dreams, dreams are like parables. Some of, some of them are literal, like they'll come to pass, but a lot of, a lot of my dreams are instructional. They're para, parabolic or like visionary imagery. And he'll use imagery to teach me a spiritual lesson. And so it's really not much different than what you would find in, in the New Testament, um, in the Savior's teachings. And so maybe just another little tweak or additional little thought that it triggers another thought for you to help you make a connection with the gospel, to make it more joyful. I think that's the biggest thing I want is for the gospel to become what it's meant to be in someone's life. And that is the, the, the glad news joyful and rejoicing. And even though life is hard and it's hard for everyone, it helps you find the joy and the beauty in life. And if, you, if you're doing it in God's way, the gospel becomes a joyful thing, a message of gladness and rejoicing, not something to fear, not something to resent, not something to that makes you feel overburdened. Um, it's only when we're doing it in an off way that it becomes what it's never meant to become for us. And so I think that's why I am to share these things. Um, so yeah. Okay. So the third group, that's kind of the rebel without a cause group. It's, it's those who once knew and are like breaking out of, and there's lots of reasons why people break out of tradition or why they um, feel like they need to leave the church or, 
I'm not trying to answer those whys, why someone's out in that space. Um, it's a big space. There's a lot out there and um, everybody has their whys. It doesn't really matter what your why is. Um, it matters that you understand where to go home to when you're ready for that, like the prodigal. When he was ready, when he was ready to come to himself, he knew where home was. And um, my first, as I said, my first breakout of captivity from the, from the Savior was out of sin. It was out of the pain of bad choices. And um, I had my whys, okay? I had my whys, why I went inactive. I had my whys. It doesn't really matter. What matters is you know where you can go when you're ready for that. And so this really is a message of invitation, just like my first dream was a message of invitation. I think it's just on another level of um, additional insights, I guess, into that. I don't know. So the point is, is that the Savior has come after me. I, I have been the rebel on the outside. I have been often these sensational um, groups and not knowing that I was taken captive. I've had the, I know I'm rebelling. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm captive. I've had the, um, I've had another kind of captivity. This wasn't actually shown in the dream, but um, I've had the captivity of being enslaved to pain that others have caused me. And, um, and he has freed me from that too. So Christ hasn't only freed me from sin, he has freed me from the, the damage that happens when someone sins against someone else. So whether that's, um, anyways, it doesn't really matter how you get hurt by others. We're all imperfect, right? So we're constantly causing people problems. We're constantly the sinner and we're constantly the sinned against. Like that's, that's a normal thing because we're human. Sorry, I gotta close this, it's getting the sun. The light is good, but it's very bright and it's blinding me. Um, kind of like the second coming, right? So anyways, we kind of take turns doing this and we will do it multiple times in a day, like where we're the ones sinning and we're the ones sinning against someone else. And thank goodness for a savior. Thank goodness for someone who has covenanted with us to redeem us, to come after us when we've been taken captive. And um, oh my goodness, I just love them. So, so how am I supposed to help people appreciate the light? The light is Christ. The light is truth, his truth, which is all truth. All truth comes from Christ, every bit of it. I love that. That's one of my favorite parts of being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is we're not afraid of truth. We love truth, we're truth seekers. And that first dream I shared was about the woman who loves to learn, right? One of my reasons I'm in the church is because I love to learn and I love more. And, and part of learning is corrective. Um, when Christ comes to redeem you out of something, he doesn't just take you out of it. He changes you so that you don't go back to it, hopefully. Um, and if you do go back to it and you reach out again, he will come after you. And, and the thing is, is when you call out, he comes to you. He is not sitting on a throne somewhere. He is sitting on the throne somewhere, but he, he's not just sitting on his throne. He's a very personal God. I, I just watched The Chosen, the Christmas with The Chosen um, in the theater here in Grand Junction, Colorado. And oh my goodness, I love it. It was so good. It was so much better than I thought it would be. I um, Not that I didn't think it would be good, but it, it really exceeded my expectations is what I'm saying. So if you haven't seen it, wow, look forward to that. Um, go see it if you can. I'd love to support anything good in a theater. Um, so anyways, but one of the things they talk about over and over again through this, this chosen Christmas with the chosen is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I love that. And I, the other thing I love is this effort to make God real to us. It's very personal and intimate. And um, yes, he is the Almighty and we worship him and I um, I feel those moments of absolute like honoring him and not feeling worthy to even look at him um, 
And it's such a proving of contraries, in the words of Jared Halverson, it's a proving of contraries that this almighty, all-powerful God descends to connect with us. Um, we definitely don't deserve it, but it's real. And it's like this proving of contraries. <laughs> and I am so grateful that he's so real. So I got to check my notes. I made a few little notes so I didn't leave something important out. And um, it's this. I, I feel like one of the reasons why I was supposed to share that dream with you is because it, I have this responsibility. Remember I said I, I felt this responsibility to help people appreciate the light? Um, I think that that's this. It's, it's me recognizing that there's others out there who are captive. And they need to understand that there's a light. There's a way back. It doesn't matter which way you've been taken captive. It doesn't matter which awakening you need to have, which coming to yourself, like the prodigal son that you need to have. Um, whether it's a you know in open rebellion or whether it's um, naively that you are off. Um, or you just have never heard, you've never even heard of Christ. The room is open to all. That classroom was full of light and it was not full. It needs to be filled. We need to invite all to come in to Christ and, um, to come and see. And, um, so I have a scripture I want to share with you now. And this ties into me waking up from a dream and having these two little thoughts come into my mind as I was laying in that sleepy stupor, like I didn't want to get up, but I needed to, you know, that feeling. Um, but I'll share those thoughts in just a minute, but I want to share this. And, and sometimes with scripture, it can be hard, especially if you are, uh, it's just hard. Scripture a lot of times is very black and white, and it can seem so harsh when you read some of it, not all of it. There's some very beautiful scriptures. But some of the scripture is, they're, they're, they seem harsh, like harsh words. This was such a beautiful insight I was given just recently, and I want to share it with you. But first, let me read the scripture. This is in the, the Book of Mormon, and it's literally the Book of Mormon within the Book of Mormon, <laughs> the uh, person who abridged this record. Um, but... It says this in Mormon chapter 3, verse 22, it says, And I would that I could persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we're preparing for the second coming. Second coming, this is not talking about actually the second coming. The second coming is kind of, a, in, in a sense, a, a judgment of sorts. But I think this might be talking about the final judgment, which we'll, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, but... This is a strong, this is like, it's almost like a fearful, to me, like when you're thinking of being judged, that can be a fearful thought and almost like a very um, repulsive thought. And it might push you away from God, but I don't want you to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I want you to come and be persuaded. Why would you want to come to a God that wants to judge you? And, um, and that's a that's an interesting question to think about but it's not really so much him that's going to be doing the judging it's going to be i think just a realization of what you chose repentance is what it really means is change it's it's kind of a change of mind and a change of heart and it's it's really an invitation. It's actually one of the most beautiful words in our language is repentance. And the reason why is because what it is, is it's your wedding invitation. It's the Lord saying, I want you with me. I really want you with me. But in my house, my house is a house of order. And, and my house has laws. And it's a beautiful place. It is absolutely glorious. And there's different areas within my home. There's many mansions and I'm preparing a place for you based on what you want, based on what you are willing to do with your life, like what you want to create. And I think that's really fascinating. The creator of all allows his creations, his children to create and to decide what they want. Repentance is just an invitation to create something better for yourself than what you already are. Christ loves us just as we are. I'm going to borrow some words from Brad Wilcox. But Christ loves us just as we are. But he loves us too much.
to leave us just as we are. And I love that about him. Um, and so here's the thoughts that I had when I was thinking, the thought that I had when I woke up that morning was the wicked, like wicked. And that's such a strong word. And I don't really love that word because frankly, we're all wicked. If you think about it, um, a wicked is sinning, right? It's going against God's laws in some way. So it's, you know, when you hear the righteous and the wicked, it just sounds so like, I don't know, there's something about it, but we're all really wicked. And we all have the potential to become righteous like the Lord because of him, because of him, right? So I was thinking, what, what really is the wicked then? And what is really the righteous? Like, what is that? And I just had this really simple phrase come to me. The wicked are unrepenting sinners. Now think back to my dream of these three different places where God rescued me from. Unrepenting sinners are could be a couple things. They could be the openly rebellious. They know better, but they're choosing not to do that. Okay, that's that's definitely someone that could be considered wicked, right? But they're also people who don't even know that they're sinning. They're sinning in ignorance, right? That would be an unrepenting sinner because they don't know there's something to repent of. Um, so that's not necessarily like, they're not bad. They just need to know what's available to them, right? So then the other thought on the flip side, the righteous, who are the righteous then? They're repenting sinners. <laughs> they're not really much difference. The only difference is, is that they know more and they're trying to live by that additional knowledge or that truth, right? And then one of their jobs is to help others know that there's more. There's more for you. Um, so there's really just sinners, <laughs> all sinners, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some of us are repenting, which means choosing to change and become more like Christ through his, the power that he offers us, his grace through his atonement. Um, and then there's those who are not repenting yet. Um, and sometimes we kind of vacillate between the two and, um, that's, you know, we do that. So what's my point? <laughs> my point is it doesn't really matter where you're at right now. Christ wants to come for you. He wants you in, at the feast. He wants you at the wedding feast. You are invited. Whether you get an official invitation or not, you're invited. This is your invitation if you haven't had it before. But come, come to the feast. He wants you to come right now, wherever you're at. He takes you from wherever you're at and he helps prepare you. He cleanses you with his living water. He helps purify you and get you ready for that wedding feast in the beautiful garments of a wedding. And, um, and there's just, there's so much more for you. And, and the why, why does he want to do that? Because he wants you to have all that he has. He wants you to be a joint heir. This is now borrowing from words from Romans. I think it's chapter eight. That we are meant to become, our potential is that we can become joint heirs with Christ. And that's a pretty beautiful thought when you think about it. It doesn't really make sense because we didn't have to do everything that he had to do. We didn't have to live a perfect, flawless life. Um, but we do have to be willing to let him change us completely. And he will do that. And he's powerful enough to do that. And one of these days, I'll share the dream that I had on that that taught me about his power and his ability to actually do the job, because I questioned that for a long time, if he was strong enough to save me. Um, but I'll share that with you someday. I, I think that might be the next one I do. But um, I love this thought. I, I was guided to this thought kind of in some closing thoughts here is in um, this comes from Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter three, Luke chapter eight and Luke chapter 11. And it's out of this book, which it makes it into this lovely story format of the Gospels. It like pulls them together, makes it one flowing story, which I really just love it. Um, but he was talking about there was this moment where his disciples come to, to the Savior and they say, hey, your mom's outside and she wants to talk to you. OK, so um, this is what they said. They said, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. Now, this is his family. This is his actual earthly family, okay? And he answered them as saying, who is my mother? 
or who are my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and stretched forth his hand to his disciples. So he's like, so here's the people around me listening to what I have to say, listening to what I'm sharing. Um, he says, behold, my mother and my brethren. Another way you could look at that is my bride, my future bride, okay? And he gave them charge concerning her, saying to my mom, saying, I go my way for my father has sent me. And who, so, so he's like, I've got, I've got to do my father's will. I've got to do my, that's how I'm taking it. It could be something else, but that's what I'm taking it as. And he says, and whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother or my bride. Okay. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, blessed is the womb which bear thee. Now this is talking about his earthly mom, his earthly mom and the paps which, which thou hast sucked. And he said, yea. So he agreed with it, which I like. He's like, yes, she is very blessed. He said, yea, and blessed are all they who hear the word of God and keep it. And I love that. All are invited to the feast. All of us can become his mother, his brother, his, his friends. Um, and it requires us kind of doing what he requires us to do, which is to follow him, right? But another th another thought, sorry, I, I know this is long. I don't blame anyone for not wanting to listen. It's okay. Um, but I, I just need to share these last few kind of closing thoughts here. Um, within the gospel, this so this, the other little thought, I had two little thoughts that came to my mind upon waking up. One was unrepenting sinners and repenting sinners. And there's only a two letter difference between those, those two phrases, the UN. No, that doesn't mean UN, sorry, <laughs> like UN, but the UN. And so that's just two little letters. If we just take those off and make some changes, we can become part of his mother and his brethren and his, you know, those who are in, invited in. We're all invited in, but we can become a part of that beautiful group. Um, the other thing is this, this, this phrase came to me and I've been pondering on it a lot since then. It said, um, I was thinking about different people. I was, I, we had just had a, a, a Christmas party with my husband's work and I met a lot of new people that I hadn't met yet. Um, cause he has some new employees and else their, their significant other or spouse. And I was like, kind of, um, it was just really fun to, to see these different people from these different backgrounds and, and interact with them and connect with them and have these bonding fun uh, moments with them. And the, and I was reflecting on that and the words that came were beautifully diverse and diversely beautiful. God's children are so different. We're all so uniquely different. Even if you have a doppelganger out there, you're different. Like you have your own little um, things about you that make you unique, uniquely you. And everybody's beautiful in their own way. They're, they're beautiful. They're divinely and diversely beautiful. And they're beautifully diverse, meaning God doesn't expect us to be cookie cutters. When we follow him, like that chosen, um, Christmas with the Chosen that I watched, one of the beautiful things about it was the diversity of the people who came to worship. It was it was music and then a little um, Christmas episode of The Chosen. And it was so beautiful and so diverse. And these people from these different Christian backgrounds coming together under one kind of, in one place, and really trying to get rid of the walls that separate us from each other. And I just really love that. So remember that you are beautiful in your diversity. You're diversely beautiful and you're beautifully diverse. And God doesn't take that away from us. Just because we start to become more one with Christ and more like him as we go along, that doesn't mean that you have to give up you either. He allows for you to be you and still be one with him. I don't know. I, that's just a beautiful thought to ponder on. You can chew on that for a little bit. In closing, and you're like, yes, thank you. Okay. I love this. This talk from this last general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is called Preparing for the Second Coming of Christ by Elder Christoffel Golden. I'm not going to read it all, just a little part from it. 
But he said, for those who have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to feel, more than ever before, we are required to confront the reality that we are getting even closer to the second coming of, uh, sorry, of Jesus Christ. That's that's the wedding feast, right? That when the bridegroom comes and finally takes the, his bride or the church or those who have followed him to himself, back to, you know, the, his presence. I mean, he's, he's so exciting. I just can't wait. He's going to literally dwell with us. Um, okay, sorry. We're getting closer, though. And then he says this. This is a little bit sobering, but also very hopeful. He says, true, great difficulties yet await those on the earth at his return. But in this regard, but in this regard, the faithful need not fear. Now I quote for a moment from the church's gospel topics under the heading Second Coming of Jesus Christ. Quote, when the Savior comes again, he will come in power and glory to claim the earth as his kingdom, his bride, right? Those who are left. His second coming will mark the beginning of the millennium. The second coming will be a fearful, mournful time for the wicked. Remember what that word means? Unrepenting sinners. Now, some people won't know. And, and that's one of the things that I love about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the additional light and truth that is there about those who never heard about Jesus Christ in this lifetime. We know we have to be baptized. We know we have to accept Jesus as our Savior. If we want to have salvation, like exaltation, and to become joint heirs with Christ, we have to have those ordinances. But think of the, I don't even know how many people, billions upon billions, that have been born into this world and died before they ever even heard of Jesus Christ. They never got to hear about him. We don't worship a God of tough luck. Like, oh, sorry, you just didn't win the lottery on that one. You didn't get to hear about me. Um, I guess you're going to hell. No, we don't worship the God of tough luck. That's quoting... Uh, I just listened to him. I don't remember. <laughs> it was in a um, podcast this last week from, um, and now my mind just went back on that. <laughs> John, by the way, and, and Hank Smith, they were interviewing someone, and I think his name is Jack or, oh, crumb. Well, anyways, we don't worship the God of tough luck. Our God is way more knowledgeable than that. He's not nearsighted. You, you cannot believe in an omniscient God and think he was nearsighted to somehow neglect the majority of his children. He's not. He had a plan. He had a plan all along. And there is a probationary state between this life and before the final judgment. Remember that scripture in Mormon that I shared about the final judgment, like the judgment seat of Christ? We're preparing for that day, but it's not just this earth life. There is a spirit world there's a kind of a holding space between the final judgment and earth life. And in that place, there are missionaries. Um, Christ in the New Testament said that he, it talks about him going to the spirits in prison and preaching. We learn more from additional revelation. I don't have that book over here with me right here, but the Doctrine and Covenants, um, there's in section 138, 7, no, 38. In 138, there's additional light and truth about that world, that spirit world, and Christ going there and what he actually did while he was there. Um, he went to the righteous and organized his forces to to get that, sorry, to help them be prepared to go to tell them, tell, sorry, I'm really stumbling over my words here. He organized the righteous, like Father Adam, like Mother Eve, um, he organized them to go and be missionaries to those who never heard about him on, in this earth life. And they, he, they are the ones that went and took the gospel to those in spirit prison, whether they were there because of a lack of knowledge or because they had openly rebelled, they got to have missionaries, they get to have missionaries come teach them. And that's the, to declare deliverance to the captives. It's not just on this in this earth life, but it's also in the spirit world. That's beautiful doctrine. They still have to have their ordinances done. And that's one of the reasons we have temples. The, the, the temples are to do their work. We go in and do proxy work for those people. They can choose to accept it or not accept it. That's their choice. But we, we do that work for them so that if they accept it, they can start progressing and moving forward. 
that's part of being about the Lord's business as we're waiting for him to come back. It's, it's doing the works that he would have us do, the things that honor him. And he is a savior, not just of the lucky few who get to hear about him, but all, all of God's children will get an equal chance, an equal opportunity to truly hear the gospel and accept or reject it or say, actually, I want to live to this accord, according to this law. So there's celestial, there's celestial, terrestrial, telestial. That's also in the, in the New Testament. But we know a little more about it because of the restoration of the gospel. And so there's these different degrees of glory that are all part of his kingdom, many mansions. And you get to choose which laws you're going to live by. And the laws that you're willing to live by are what you will inherit. And those who don't want any single part of any kind of goodness of God, there's a place for them as well. And that's where Satan and his minions are, outer darkness. And they're here on earth right now. But they only have a window. They have this window of time to torment us and tempt us and mess with us. But their window of time closes when the final judgment happens. And then they get assigned to their non-kingdom of glory, outer darkness, which I don't have anything to do with that. But the point is, is God has a plan for all of his children. And he has self, his plan of salvation is very broad. It's very big. It's not narrow. It's not heaven or hell. There's, there's literally all these degrees of glory based on what you were willing to live. And if you think about it logically, doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make sense? Because don't we all know people who live more saintly than others? Don't we all know people who are actually decent people, but they're breaking lots of God's laws, even knowingly? And, well, there's a place for them. There's a, there's a place in his kingdom for them. And so those who are, it's just amazing to me. The gospel is amazing. Sorry. So yes, the second coming will be a fearful, mournful time for the wicked. Um, but there's still a plan for them, still, okay? We, we, there's a plan. But it will be a day of peace for the righteous. They that are wise, so the Lord declared, they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived, verily I stand to you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. And the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance, and they shall multiply and wax strong, and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. That's amazing. For the Lord shall be in their midst, and his glory shall be upon them, and he will be their king and their law giver. So, our job is to prepare. We all know that if we're, if we're members of the church or we're members of a Christian denomination somewhere, we know that we're supposed to be preparing for this. Prepare. The doors, if you listen to my other dream, they are closing. We're getting closer. Those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that understands, we're not blind to the signs of the times. They're happening all around us and have been for a long time. But it's not too late. It's not too late to be ready for that joyous occasion. Um, anyways, so get ready. <laughs> Invite those who are not aware to, to come, to come and be prepared for that feast. And if you have somehow gotten yourself captive somehow, whether you realize it or not, now maybe you're a little waking up to that, come, come and let him liberate you. And that's my prayer for all of us. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.